God the glory for what he is still able to do. And I know I've been in that place many times where Pastor Joey's at tonight and um, beside of a bedside waiting on that event to happen. But you know, there's something that's even greater event to know that, uh, and I hate to say it this way, but the plug has been pulled. The life support here is given up. But it's the fact that there's something even greater than that. And the greater thing of that is the fact that we do not know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as our Savior. Because we have no chance of life. I know that uh, Sue and I, and I'm going to quit rambling and we can get on with it tonight, okay. But uh, Sue and I were at winston Settlement Hospital with a friend of ours who was in ministry. And uh, his wife was in the hospital. And she was in this stage ready to go be with the Lord. Uh, her husband had a heart condition, and he was down in the emergency room having heart conditions, and I was running from emergency room back to her room, and about that time, their son also had situations, and he was in another area. So all of a sudden, because of one, there was three and uh, everything, but, you know, ev everything was in kind of an uproar. But I walked back into her room, in those last moments of her life here upon this earth and she had the most beautiful smile upon her face because she was ready she was ready to reach out and take the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and you know whenever we think about fulfillment that is truly fulfillment and knowing that but I just welcome you tonight and just want to get let you know about that before we do get started and uh, just give God the glory for what he can do tonight and do in our life uh, remember all those things that are coming up we've got a the team, I met them going out as we were coming in. We've got some extra cars and no people because they're in Gastonia. How about that? But they've gone to Gastonia to, to work there in the mission tonight. And we just pray for uh, God's spirit to direct them and guide them through this time. And just remember the things that are coming this week. Remember prayer prayer time tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Uh, be here to pray together and worship the Lord together in that. And uh, also Wednesday night for uh, also our midweek Bible study and uh, so there's there's just a lot going on so get on board and if uh, I know we've already got seven signed up praise the Lord but uh, <coughs> going to be at uh, Christian ministry on the 7th of May this is our first activity coming up here so uh, whenever we we're coming into that we got uh, seven already signed up so if you'd like to go and wash dishes or help or whatever uh, just put your name on there, but that's going to be the 7th from 9 o'clock. Meet there at 9 o'clock from 9 to 1 on the 7th of May. So uh, remember also on the 30th, there's a sign-up sheet out here next Sunday, 6 o'clock. We're going to have a Sunday sing. So after the singing's over, we're going to be able to fellowship. Uh, so just write down the kind of food and good stuff you want to bring, and so we can uh, all share together. How about that? And uh, we just praise God for that. Something new on the calendar. She's, she says I'm good. How about that? <laughs> but we just want to remember those two, remember Johnny Mace again, and, and all those that were mentioned this morning and uh, on our prayer list. And, you know, God's able, no matter what situation we might face, he's able to take care of every need that we have. And uh, I know that uh, a little over a week ago I was having some issues, and God took care of it. Uh, this sinus stuff was going on and my jaw was hurting and everything else and I get up middle of the night and put a heating pad on it do whatever try to get some relief and thank you Jesus it is gone 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 so <laughs> that is that is a good thing just remember Max Cora has passed away and remember his family also remember Johnny Mace uh, as the pastor's there now with the family and uh also, remember Terry Stewart, who's in the hospital with uh, multiple medical problems. Uh, also, Randy Pater. Uh, Pater, I can't talk tonight. Surgery, uh, prostate cancer, so to remember him, that's coming up. Uh, Sylvia Clark, still, that's one of our friends from way back, still needs uh, hip surgery. She has issues going there. Also, remember uh, Susan and Joe. Uh, Susan's going through the situation with her back. Uh, she, she can come forth at one time and the next time it kind of catches again so uh, just pray that God's going to totally heal her and take care of all that in her in her back in the back issues 
Also, Matthew Williamson, the uh, lung transplant. Uh, pray that that will come forth and, and God will restore <coughs> those things which are happening there. The Myers story, uh, multiple health issues. Just remember her in prayer. Uh, Joe Metz, uh, possible many strokes is happening. Uh, Omar Barris, uh, rare heart condition or heart cancer, excuse me. But uh, it is a condition. It's cancer, okay? We just praise God that uh, when you know what it is, of course, if you don't know what it is, God can take care of it anyway. But the fact that all these things, and Hazel Stanley got a broke hip, so just pray for her and her healing that uh, all these things will come forth. Do we have any other uh, spoken prayer requests? Okay. Amen. <laughs> and you got to know Melba to know Melba. Okay, she's a Reese Seven sister from uh, way back when. And uh, she's not my sister. It's my wife's sister meeting. Well, anyway, it's a ladies' ministry, all right? <laughs> but she's a sister in the Lord. But um, we, just, we praise God for what God is doing uh, in our midst. And uh, there's so much. My wife had gone uh, to... Columbia Friday uh, to meet with uh, Princess and I will not dare t say her last name because I can't pronounce it Mboho okay you got it all right but uh, she is from Nigeria she is living in uh, Columbia and uh, she's a sister too if you want to put it that way her husband here he's a bishop uh, she is a princess of a African tribe and they have over 2,000 orphans that are there in uh, some orphanages they take care of and feed. And some of the children have gone home now. Some of them, and it sounds kind of critical whenever you talk about an orphanage, but they come to a certain age and they have the ability to go home if they are so desired to go home. So it's a lot of people who actually bring the children and give their children to this organization to raise their children. And that's what they're in the midst of doing, taking care of them until they are placed or until they get old enough to leave and go on their own. But they've got about 2,000 children that they're taking care of, got two different schools or two different facilities they're doing that. But it's a thing of faith, and God is uh, directing that. And uh, it's a lot, there's a lot going on, guys. It's a whole lot going on in the world today. And we just, we just need to pray and support all the ministries and things of our church and the community because it's very needful to get the word out, the word of Jesus Christ. How many unspoken requests do we have? Okay. Well, let's just pray. Father God, I just thank you. I praise you that, uh, Lord God, whether spoken or unspoken, you know it already. You know the need. You know the hurt. You know the pain. Father God, you know that those needs for reconciliation, you know the needs, Father God, that we can come to you, not only to be reconciled to you through Jesus Christ our Lord, but to re be re reconciled with the different individuals, the body of the church. And Father, with our neighbor and with our friend. And Father, if there's anything tonight that, that might stand before between us and you, I just pray, Father God, that you will show us that we can ask for forgiveness, that we can ask, Father God, and make it right between those where we have ought. Because, Lord, you said not even to come and to bring an offering if there was anything that stood between us. And, Lord, I just pray tonight that you will vanquish anything that might stand in front of us that would keep us from worshiping you, keep us from hearing you, keep us from having knowledge of who you are in our life. And, Father, we just give you praise, give you thanks for what you're about to do. Uh, Father, for Johnny Mace. And, Lord God, for his family. And I just ask that through everything that's happening that they may see you and none other. And, Lord, may we by this experience tonight see you and none other. And, Lord, I just thank you. I praise you for that which has already happened today. And I thank you for that which is about to come. And, Father, we just thank you for each individual who have journeyed out today. Lord God, protect them, guide them through this time. May our hearts be open that we can hear you, Lord God, even as you speak unto us. For it's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> when Pastor Joy called me this afternoon and said that he was going to be leaving, he gave me a little bit of a notice of a maybe, okay? <laughs> 
at, at 3.30, I got the okay. So uh, that's when I found out that he would be going, and he said, how about standing in? So I can't stand in for him, but I can stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim his word because I can't jump up and down this, okay? So don't look for it, all right? <laughs> we got a few years. But, you know, whenever we, we look at things in our life, and I'm going to take you on a journey. We're going to go back in uh, actually where a pastor has been teaching at. We're going to go back to Luke, the fourth chapter, and uh, we're going to pick up there in in verse 16, just in a few minutes, and I'm going to be going through and kind of be teaching as we go through. But uh, it, it brought back a lot of memories. And you say, how can he bring back memories? Well, a lot of things that are happening here brought back memories from the fact of places that it spoke about that God has allowed me to walk and places he has allowed me to go. And, and I, I am so, so much uh, in his debt for what God has allowed me to do because whenever we come and we talk about Capernaum, I've been in the synagogue where Jesus is taught at. I have been to the house where Peter's mother-in-law lived. I've been to all these places and I've been across the Sea of Galilee. I've been up to where the Beatitudes were taught. I've been down the streets of Jerusalem. I've been to the Garden Tomb. I've been to Egypt and I've been to the Great Pyramids. I've been in all, all types of places, but one thing on mine, God, can I get closer to you? Can I see you? And, you know, everything that we, we look for, you know, you can go and you can walk up and down the streets of Jerusalem and those places with the Val, Val de Rosa, and I can't say it, my tongue got tangled up, but uh, whenever you go through the, the pathway that Jesus Christ took as he went out that gate and went to Calvary, you can walk it, but he's not there. You can go to the tomb and you can be there and you can be amazed at what's there and you can go in that empty tomb and you can see where it was hewn out for him to lay, but he's not there. Now, well, you can walk into all these places where he walked. You can go to, to Capernaum. You can go to Tiberias. You can go along the, the edge of the Sea of Galilee where he taught, but he's not there. You can go to Nazareth, to the place where he was born. He's not there. But in all these places, in all these paths, in all the places when you go to the Mount of Olives where he was seen to arise and ascend into heaven, but he's not there. But my friends, I'll give you a good news. He's coming back. <laughs> he's coming back. You know, we can go and we can look and we can see where he's been. We can see the evidence of things that's happened and understand the fact that we cannot reach out and touch him physically today, but he is here to touch us tonight, and he's here to fulfill us and our needs in our life because he is here by his spirit, saith the Lord. And whenever we come and understand this, and, and even as Jesus Christ has given, and we find that the fact that here in, in verse 16, and I'm not going to ask you to stand because we're going to just start teaching and go through, but I just ask that you be with in, much in prayer that God will speak to you and that he will reveal his desire in your life tonight. It says in verse 16 of chapter 4 of Luke, it says, So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel unto the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty unto the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book. And he gave it back into the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were there in the synagogue were fixed on him. Jesus Christ came and he spoke and he proclaimed the fact that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now we talk about walking in the Spirit and we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, that he comes to give us power and ability. Jesus told those, we know that, go back to Acts 2, and it talks about the fact that he's told his disciples, those who were following him, to go to Jerusalem and tarry until the power of the Spirit came. 
because the Lord Jesus Christ wanted them to be able to go and to proclaim the word. He wanted them to be able to have power and ability to do that which he had called them to do. And friends, he has asked us, as he has called us, to come forth. And I know even as Pastor spoke this morning, that we need to have the Holy Spirit and his power that we can stand for who he is today in this world. I know that we're, set, we're challenged by everything that's around us and different thoughts and thought frames, but there is only one gospel and there is only one Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one. There are many religions. There are many different churches, but there is only one Lord. There is only one God. And I know that one thing that you will find that whenever you pass through, and I, I've looked and looked and, uh, through these places we've gone, and, and there are many things worshipped. Because whenever we were in Kenya some years ago, and I'm going to pull my watch off so I can see what time it is. How about that? I, I promise I'll behave, okay? But whenever we look at these things, that one of the things that we saw, we saw many churches. We saw many different types of worship. Not only were we there preaching in a Christian church, a gospel church, but when we came to it and we looked at it, there were many other things that were going on. There were different activities and religions among the tribes of the people of Africa. And they would go into the mountains and they would worship. And some of these people would go up and they would offer sacrifices of goats and different things as they would worship. But they were in worshiping a demon. They were devil worshipers. And whenever you look and you walk beside these people, you don't know if they are or if they're not. When you're in the marketplace, you have no clue. And friends, whenever we're in the marketplace today, no matter where it's at, whether it's in Charlotte, Lincoln, or wherever you might go, you don't know who's next to you. You don't know what desire they have. You don't know what conviction they have. You don't know anything about them. But one thing that you do know, that the Holy Spirit will guide you as you desire to proclaim who he is through your life. And I know it's something that we can do. We can speak a lot. We can tell the people a lot of things. But it's by our life that we show the world who we are. It's by our life. You see, it talks about the fact that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, upon Jesus Christ. And you know, when we think about it, you know, we can find that here that the Holy Spirit was in his incarnation. It was in his birth, as Pastor was talking about this morning. It was in his growth as he came forth into a young man. It was in his baptism. It was in his temptation. It was in his ministry. It was in the miracles that were performed. It was in his death. It was in his resurrection. And it was in his glorification that was to come. The Holy Spirit guided Christ's life completely. And I ask a question tonight as we go through, how are we? Is the Holy Spirit guiding us and, con and controlling us and directing us in this venture that we have, in this adventure that we have with the Lord? When it came to the fact that Jesus read these verses, as he read from Isaiah, that he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down, and when he sat down, all the eyes of them were fastened there, and they were looking at him for a reason. And they were looking at him, and they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? Isn't this the boy from Nazareth? That's where he was at talking. Isn't this Joseph's son? He was in Nazareth when this was happening. He was in his hometown. How could it be that he is speaking these things because he is Joseph's son? He is the son of a carpenter. And I ask you something tonight. I don't know what your father did. I don't know what your mother has done. I don't know what profession they might have had. But you know, it does not matter what your father was or what your mother was or what your sister or brother is or anything else, but what are you? Because when it come down to Jesus Christ, they started trying to evaluate him by the people who were around him and what lineage he came out of and who his parents were. Because we can go back and we can find flaws that are in our, our past, in our life, or previous in our life, but we cannot find any flaw that where God has taken and he has removed those things and he has proclaimed that we are innocent and he has proclaimed the fact that we are set free and he has proclaimed the fact that we are not the same anymore, that we are not that person that they're thinking about. 
because now the Holy Spirit is guiding and directing us in his path. You see that Jesus, he came to Nazareth. And it's talking about the fact that he went somewhere. Where are you going? What are you going to do? We come down to verse 31 of the same chapter, verse of chapter 4. And it says, then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. And now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him into the mist, it came out of him and did not hurt him. And then when they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word is this is, for with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report of him, about him, went out through every place and the surrounding region. Well, he came down to Capernaum. He came down to a Capernaum where there was the ships would land, the boats would stop, the fish were brought off the boats from the fishermen. He came down to Capernaum where there was a, a synagogue that was built. And if it has not been destroyed in the past many years since I've been there, the fact that you can still see the mosaic floor there where Jesus stood and where he walked, and you can see the columns that were there that surrounded the building that helped, helped the ceiling up. You can see the, the wine press outside. I'm going to call it the wine press, but it wasn't a wine press. It was an olive press. That's what we think about it. It was an olive press, hewn out of rock, but it was there to crush, to bring forth the juice, the liquid out of those things. And, you know, whenever we look at these things and, and, I, and saying the, the wine press, first of all, you know, whenever you take grapes and you crush it, you're, you're after the juice. You take olives and you crush it, you're after the juice. You're after what's inside. You're after what's valuable. Understand why God allows us to be crushed sometimes. Allows us to go through situations in our life that we can all understand. Allows us to go through places that are hurtful. Allows us to go places where there's pain. Allows us to go through things that pulls us where we don't want to be pulled. But Jesus went to Capernaum. He went there and he taught in the synagogues. It says, as he was teaching, there was this one that came there, and he was had an unclean demon, a spirit that was within him. And you'll have to understand the fact that there was something that was knowledgeable, and you can go back to the demonic in the Gadarenes across on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And you have to understand the Sea of Galilee is about the size of Lake Norman. It's about six miles wide and about 14 miles long. And here you can look across it from one side to the other. You can see the mountains on the other side. But yet all around the Sea of Galilee were points of emphasis where Jesus went and things happened. And many times he talked from the, from the boats. And many times he's taught on shore. And many times he went up to the mount. Many times he went to these places and the people followed him because they wanted to hear what he had to say. Because you see, one of the things that happened that the demons knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. But Jesus rebuked them. Jesus said, be quiet and come out of him. Why did he say, be quiet? The demon knew. But Jesus didn't want anybody else to know at that time. Jesus wanted them to know how much God loved them. Jesus wanted them to know how much 
all these things were going to cost because his salvation that was going to be offered freely to us was going to cost him dearly and God dearly. Because whenever they heard him speak and they said, what authority he has, where does all this authority come from? But he spoke with authority that was given by him, to him by the Father in heaven. And this report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region, in the area, and people came to see. People came to see this man. One of the things that uh, intrigues me whenever I walked out, of course, we had a, a little escort. I'm going to say escort when was in Israel. Came out of the synagogue and walked uh, just about far from here to the door where we go out into the foyer area. And there's where Peter's mother-in-law was. That was her house. Of course, today there's not a roof on it. There's just an outline of the foundation of buildings. But this is where she lived. And he went there. Now, you, you think about a house. You know, we talk about something that's 1,500 square feet, 2,000 square feet, or whatever. I don't know what size house you live in or what size apartment you live in. The majority of the houses in that day was about 8 by 10, okay? Just big enough to put you a mat on the floor, and that's where you lived at. A lady there when I was there in 1980, first time, and whenever we seen seen that, she wanted me to come and look at her house, and she had one door and one window. She cooked outside. She had a, a pump-up blowtorch that she singed the the little pin feathers off of her chicken that she plucked and all this kind of thing, but she was very proud of her house. You see, the house doesn't really have any furniture. The house doesn't really have anything there at all because that's where you lay your mat and you lay your body and that's where you sleep. That was the purpose of the house. All other activities happened outside. Everything else went on outside in the courtyard or on the side of the street or where they might have been going. And she said there was something unique about that lady that I saw. There's something unique about the people that we go to in, in third world countries and the fact that whenever you go there, there is the fact that you go and you buy your food, you come home and you immediately you cook it. There's no refrigeration, there's no electricity, there's nothing. You know, we, we take for granted a lot of things that God has given us. Whenever we look and understand that here that he went to Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law's house, it says in verse 38, it said, Now he arose from the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever. And they made a request of him concerning her. Isn't that, isn't that good? They made a request of him concerning her. Because those things that were concerning about the fact that she's sick. And what was concerning about that was the fact that they knew who Jesus was. That he was able to touch, he was able to heal, that he was able to bring forth miracles. Because he was the one. In verse 39 it says, so he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Immediately. High fever, sick, can't do anything. And I'm, I'm sorry, my, my brain kind of flip-flops. And nobody's ever known about that, have you? My wife and I were in Kenya. We went up to a, a little town called Mogwani, about 150 miles north of Nairobi, almost at the uh, Somalia line if you want to put it that way or border anyway we went there and we had gone and we'd stayed there and we had people who were waiting on us hand and foot you know they they came to serve us and, and guys it, it gives you a, a different feeling about uh, being someone who is important to them I had a little backpack on my back and uh, don't get your wrong idea ladies okay 
but the women over there would absolutely almost have a battle desiring to carry my backpack. Do you know why? Because they believed that if they helped the pastor, they received a prophet's reward from God. And they would wait on you hand and foot. You didn't have to do nothing. They cooked for you. They did everything. They wanted to make sure that you had everything that you needed, even though they didn't have anything. But they wanted to serve. They wanted to help you. And one of the ladies who was doing that, she took us to show us her house that she had built. Her husband was away in the gold mines, and for many years he never did come back. She had four children. She built about an 8 by 12 little shack, put a roof on it, and she had little benches around that they could sleep on. The three rocks in the pot were outside. That's what we saw after we got there, but on the way there, we came by her mother's house, and her mother was sick. We walked into that little house, a little thatched roof. She was laying on the bed, and she was sick. She couldn't get up. I ventured across to the other side of this small room, and I sit down on another little flat bed-type stretch thing. I don't know what you call it anyway. It's like where you hang something. I, that's where I sit. She was in the bed. My wife came, and she sat down beside of her on her bed. We're going to call the bed anyway. Her daughter stood there in the room. And she was telling my wife what was happening with her, and Sue reached over, and she put her arm around her. Started talking to her. Started praying for her as we prayed together. She couldn't understand English. She couldn't understand our language. She didn't know what we were saying. Her daughter could interpret what she was saying to us. But even as we were there and we left that place after praying for her and we walked probably another 50, 75 yards down the little pathway seeing her house and we saw it, Probably 30 minutes later, we came back up that pathway. The lady that was with us, she, she let out. She said it English first, and then she said it in their language. She said, Mom, what you doing? Mom wasn't in the bed any longer. Mom had come out, and she was sitting beside the pathway, and she was weaving a basket. She said, I'm well. God, heal me. You know, whenever we come and we look at the fact that whenever we have something of authority that Jesus Christ has given us, he has given us an ability if we believe and if we ask. And she was just excited because God had healed her. And whenever we come and we look in verse 40, it says the sun was setting and all those who were, had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and that's to Jesus. And he, Jesus, laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. <laughs> uh, where's the time clock at? When the sun was setting, I mean, he, he's been up since morning, and the sun's setting, the sun's going down, it's getting dark, and people are being brought because they know that at Jesus they were going to find healing. And I want you to understand one more thing in, in, in this, in the reality of it. You know, a lot of times we have situations in our life, a lot of times we want somebody to pray for us, but we never ask. You'll understand that Jesus Christ, whenever you see that where he has healed people, he heals people who comes and ask, who comes to him. There were many people who Jesus passed who were lame. There were many people who Jesus passed who had needs, but they did not come to him. They did not ask of him. So they were not healed. Those who were brought and those who came, those who asked, were healed. Don't expect God to jerk you out of your situation unless you ask. Whenever we come, we need to understand that God will do that. 
if we trust him and if we ask him. Because he is father. He will hear and he will answer and he will fulfill those things for his children if we but ask. And somehow or another we, we kind of come into this area and I'm, I'm getting in here from the fact that you know, we, we suffer things and we have ish issues in our life. We have issues in our family. We have different things going on. And you say, well, God knows everything. He knows what I'm walking through. Everybody else in the community knows it too, okay? But we've got to ask. We've got to ask him to take care of that need that's in our life. We've got to ask him to bring healing in our life. We've got to ask him to bring reconciliation in our life. We've got to ask him to forgive us of those things in our life that we have not asked for forgiveness for. We've got to ask him. But it says all those, he healed them. And verse 41 says, And demons also came out, many crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuked them and did not allow them to speak, for they knew he was the Christ. <laughs> the demons were coming out. You know, whenever we look at the scripture and, and ask many questions sometimes, you know, when Jesus goes, all this was happening at night. Verse 42 says, and now when it was day, you know, this was, this was transpiring in the nighttime. We, we can ask a question, Lord, when did you sleep? Lord, when did, when did you take your rest? Because in, in our own life today, we're looking for those restful periods. We're looking for those times that we, we take a rest. We look for those times that we're going to just lay it down and because we have endured as long as we want to endure you know, I, I just wonder, in reality, how often Jesus actually ever rested. You see, because whenever he would look at a person, he knew their hearts, he knew their thoughts, he knew their minds, he knew what they were thinking, he knew what they were going through. And even in the midst of all that, he was waiting on something to happen. <laughs> and probably going through his mind, as it has mine about individuals who I've been around, I would ask a question and to myself, not to them. Why don't you just ask? Why don't you ask? You see people many times that uh, might have a need and can't walk well or, or whatever. They might need assistance coming up steps. They might need assistance with many things. And a lot of people, you know, try to struggle through and, and don't ask, will you please help me with the door? Will you do this or will you do that? They don't ask because they're proud. And guys, sometimes we're so proud we don't ask our Father to help us because we think we can handle it ourselves. Whenever we come to verse 42 down through 44, it says, And now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. Wow. They liked what Jesus brought. They came and they wanted him to stay. They didn't want him to leave. They wanted to stay there. But he said in verse 43, but he said to them, I must preach the gospel, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also because for this purpose I have been sent. You know, just earlier we said, hear and saw in the very part that comes back from Isaiah the fact that that he came to proclaim the word of God he came to proclaim and bring those things he came to release those who were in bondage he came to set at liberty uh, those who were captives he came to recover the sight of the blind and if you look on the sight of the blind it's not the fact that they were blind and could not see it was the fact that they were blinded by sin they were blinded by the things of the world that they could not see God at all. They were blinded spiritually. It wasn't blinded eyes that they could not see. Of course, he, he healed the blinded eyes, but if you go back into this word and search it out, it's talking about being spiritually blind. Can't see. But Jesus said, I've got to go to other cities. Got to go to other places. Verse 44 says, and he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee got to go somewhere else I got to go a little bit further 
And you know, whenever we, we look at these scriptures and ask a question about them, why do we have to go? Why do we have to go? Why do we have to proclaim the word of, of the Lord Jesus Christ to every creature that we're around? Why do we have to live in such a way that they will ask, why are you different? Have you ever been asked that? I have. Why are you different? I told Sister Tracy, I said, we might make it through the night. We might not make it, but a cutoff time, whatever time it might be. Lord knows. Yesterday at um, Farmer's Market, go there and have fun. We leave about 5.30 in the morning, get down there in the dark, and back a trailer into a parking slot. And my sweet wife is out there with a flashlight shining on a white line so I know where to hit it, okay? So I, I back the trailer in there and I unhook and take it around and take the truck and park it in another parking lot so we can put up the tent and do all this good stuff and the tables and start getting the, uh, the flowers and the goodies out and all that kind of thing. And, of course, the sun is starting to rise after a while. <laughs> and yesterday was a great day because we got to meet a lot of people. A man stopped in the, in the road, and he, they had purchased something. I took it to the car, and he stopped there, and, and he said, we'll be back next week. He said, I enjoy talking to you. He said, we'll be coming back every week. I didn't realize that I had said anything that would impress him to come back. Must have. A young woman came, and she had a little daughter. She looked like she was probably three years old, and she was pushing a little baby doll stroller, cart, whatever you want to call it. That's past my time. I'm grandpa now, great-grandpa, great-grandpa, you know, I, I'm old, okay? But whenever we was coming, that she had this little doll in her head, a hand, and uh, it was one that was bald-headed. You know, you've seen them bald-headed baby dolls, and it was kind of fluffy and everything, but uh, her mom was pushing the little cart, and, the ba and she was carrying the little baby, baby doll, that is. And something just hit my mind. I reckon the Lord hit my mind. There's something in the trailer you need to go get. So I've got a trailer that's got all kind of cabinets in there, and I've got all kind of stuff in there, okay? So I go in there, and I opened up the cabinet door, and I looked in there, and there it was on top. And there was a little baby doll that had a dress on it, had long curly blonde hair, two pink ribbons in its hair, and all this kind of thing, wide open eyes. And I picked it up, and I took it back, and I had it laying in my arm like you would a baby, and I took it around there. And the little girl looked at it. She didn't make no mention. And I said, got something for you. And I just took, because she still had her little one, and I put it down in the, in the little stroller. And I laid it in there and positioned it so she could see it. And they were leaving, getting ready to leave. They, they was traveling on through. And her mother had told my wife that uh, whenever she got something for Christmas, it might be six months later before she ever picked it up and started playing with it. Well, she's still hanging on to her little bald-headed baby. That's what I'm going to call it, okay? She was still playing with that baby and everything had it. And when she turned to walk away, she looked over. She picked that baby up, the little curly-headed one, and she put hers down, and she took it, and she held it, and she was stroking the hair of its head. You know, something that will happen is that little girl won't forget it. Because there's been some little boys, too, that have come by, and I've got notes from their mother, parents, because some little something that was given made a difference in their life. You know, when we look at our life, why do we proclaim Christ through our living, through our life? We're going to go back to Ezekiel real quickly in summing up tonight. In the second chapter of Ezekiel, and I'm going to start off with actually the last part of verse 28, and I don't think I sold Tr Sister Tracy that. The last section of, of verse 28 of chapter 1 says, And so when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one speaking. 
In chapter 2, verse 1 says, And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. And then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet. And I heard him who spoke to me. And he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. And they and their fathers have transgressed against me this very day. For they are imprudent and stubborn children. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus saith the Lord God. As for them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for whether they are a re for they are a rebellious house, and yet they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, they are, and and you dwell among scorpions. Do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks though they, they are a rebellious house. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Do not be rebellious like the rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And now when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me. And behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mournings and woe. <laughs> Ezekiel saw in the very part that he saw the Lord. And the Lord said, Son of man, stand up. Because you're going to become a prophet unto a rebellious house. You're going to become a prophet unto a people that don't want to hear. And I want you to understand tonight, I mean, this is talking about in Ezekiel's time, but it is no different from the fact that what God has asked you to do in this century that we're living in. Because we're living in a country that is rebellious. We're living in cities that are rebellious. We're living among a people that is rebellious and does not want to hear the word of the God. They, do, they want to reject him, and they have rejected him. They have transgressed against him. And they do not want to know what's going to happen to them. They don't want you to share that. And here God is speaking to Ezekiel. He said, whether they hear you or, and, and accept or whether they refuse what you say, you got to tell them. <laughs> I don't know how to be any plainer than that. you got to tell them. They might speak against you. They might say things about you. They might do whatever, but you've got to tell them. Why do we have to tell them? That whenever we come and, and understand that Jesus Christ, as we have received him as our Lord and Savior, that he spoke in, in the chapter 28 of Matthew, and he, he gave us a commission to go unto all the world and to make disciples or disciplined ones like we are. Oops. How are we? That whenever we come and we look that we're to transfer this individual whom we are to be like Jesus Christ, we are to be like Jesus Christ, and we are to transform that into someone else's life, and they are to become like Jesus Christ because we are to be a reflection of him. And whenever we are a reflection of him, and people can see Jesus Christ in us and understand that there is something different about us because, my friends, I am not the same person I used to be. I'm not the one who is bound by the sins and the chains and the things and the shackles of a past life and past mistakes. But God has set me free from those things and he has, he has made me to become his righteousness. Christ is my righteousness. And he has come into my life. But one thing about it, that we have to proclaim who Jesus Christ is because he says, go and tell. Go tell. The people, the nations, wherever you go, go tell them. Tell them. When we come to, to chapter 3, just for a moment, in verse 16 of chapter 3 of Ezekiel, and it says, And now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. Woo, can you get any plainer than that? Hear me speak to you and give them warning, and I'm giving you my warning that you're going to tell them 
these things. And he said, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you shall you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. You know, whenever we look at it, the Lord said here to Ezekiel, said, if you don't tell them, you're guilty of the death that they're going to die. If you see somebody standing in the road, a child standing in the road, and a car coming down the road, what are you going to do? Are you going to stand there and watch it? Or are you going to go try to rescue them? It's the same thing here. It talks about the fact that if you see a person who has iniquity in their life, and they're in a wicked way, and they're living wicked, and they do not know God, that you are to tell them that they shall not die in their iniquity, that they will be saved, that they will have ability there to, to receive and be rescued from that which they're in. But verse 19 says, Yet if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, then he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. You're not guilty. If you don't tell them you're guilty, if you tell them you're not guilty. And God is, you know, putting it out here real quick that you are the responsible party if this person departs from this earth and does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior or has an ability to accept him, then it is your, it's on your cart. You may walk, walk beside of them in the workplace. You may know them in the shopping place. You may sit in the same beauty shop. There's opportunity that comes that we can tell them about Jesus Christ. And, you know, you don't have to come out and hit somebody over the head with a Bible. I got some big Bibles and little Bibles, whatever. You don't have to hit somebody over the head with a Bible. Live the truth. Live the truth. Live Jesus Christ. I know I, I go to a, some ladies, that, uh, I say ladies, they're young ladies, and one calls herself, I, I'm, I'm her daddy, because she clipped my ear when she's cutting my hair, and all that kind of thing, because her dad's the only one she's ever clipped besides me, or so she says. Anyway, that uh, she nicked my ear, but she always comes, and I sit down, and before we get very far, you know, we're talking about Jesus. Not long before, a lot of other people around sitting in the beauty shops talking about Jesus. It's something that you can walk in and one day, and this lady I'm talking about, that she was sick and she was going to have to go to the hospital. And she was sitting in the back room. And I came in the back door, okay? And she was sitting there. And I knelt down beside of her. And another lady who was in there that was come for a, a hair job, whatever it might have been. I don't know what it was, but she was a nurse, and she went out to the car and got a blood pressure cup and everything, and she started taking her blood pressure. She was having issues. I didn't say anything to anybody, didn't ask her whether to or whether or not. I just laid hands on her and started praying for her. And the woman, and I wasn't praying out loud, God knew it. And the woman who was there taking her blood pressure and looking at everything, she saw something happen. And she looked at me. A big smile came on her face. And friends, it was not the end, but it was the beginning of a relationship with this young woman and a closer walk with God. Because you come out of that where you're hiding and you show forth who the Lord Jesus Christ is. But it says in verse 20. Now this, this is where it kind of catches us. Because whenever you, you look in this is the fact that sometimes we consider ourselves righteous because we come to church. We come to Bible study. We come to prayer time. We do good things. We feel like that we're right with God. Okay? That's what righteous means, being right. 
So we find here that it says in verse 20, and again, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity. It says, and I will lay a stumbling block before him and he shall die because you did not give him a warning and he shall die in his sin. And, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood I will require at your hand. Whoa. We all in church, we're in our men's group, we're in our ladies' group, we're, we're all around and we're in our circle, Christian circles. Okay? Can I put it that way? And yet in one of those in that circle and in one of those in that group, one of those sitting in the pews, you know that there's things that are happening in their life that is not right before God. It's giving another testimony. God tells us here, if you see this brother or this sister and they are in sin, even though that they are thought to be righteous, their name's on the church roll, they've been baptized in the water, all, all these things that we say are sealers of it, but here he's saying to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, if you see this people, it's a funny thing, he's telling us the same thing. If you see these people who have slipped and you don't say anything to them, I'm going to require it of you. Sometimes you get to places you don't know what to, <laughs> whether to or whether not to because I love my wife very dearly, but we have been through some things in our past and it wasn't her, it was me. Because it doesn't matter who you are. I was in a church, teaching Sunday school, in my 20s, a young deacon. In my 20s, a young trustee of the church. All these type things. And sin came. And the thing that happened that all those people who were around me, all those people who were older, all those who were in their 40s and 50s, and they knew what was going on, and these, they saw what was happening in my life, that they said they didn't say anything to me because I knew more about the Bible than they knew. But I was walking in sin. I was in church doing all the stuff. But my life was not right before God. People saw it. But they never spoke it. What does that do? It says in this scripture, in relationship, it says, if you see one in such a place, he said, I'm going to lay a stumbling block before him and he shall die. And because you do not give him a warning, he shall die in his sin and his righteousness shall which he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood will, I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man, that righteous should not sin, and he does not sin. He shall surely live because he took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. There's a question that was asked with Cain. Where's Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? Do I watch after my brother? Do I watch after those who are around us? Do I watch after those who are uh, in, in the very fact of a part of the ministry at a whole or is a kingdom ministry or whatever it might be? Are we really close to our brother and our sister? In Christ. Some years ago, we were in a church down at Huntersville, and the men had a group, and we called it an accountability group. And I'm going to pick on Mike, okay? Is that, is that good? 
we knew that there were a lot of our guys that they were out on the road traveling. They went places, and one of the things that they would do, that they had everybody's number, and about 9 o'clock at night or a certain time of night, they would call, once someone would call them and say, hey, Mike, what you doing? How you doing today? Did you have a good trip? Yeah. What you watching on TV? What you reading? What you do today? Who'd you talk to? Accountability. That somebody's asking a question about his life and what he's doing because he's away from home and he's away from his wife and he's out here for several days away and all kind of things can come into your life and creep into your life. It might be on the TV. It might be on a book you pick up. It might be on an encounter with somebody while you're eating dinner. It might be anything. How are you, Mike? Just wanted to let you know we're thinking about you. You know, we need to have accountability in the church. We need to have accountability among us as men and women that whenever we can support each other and we can reach out and touch those because, you know, I, I think the Lord speaks pretty clearly in the fact that we got one more place and we're, it's completed. And that's in the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel. It says it again. It says, nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way. He shall die in his iniquity. But if you have delivered your soul. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus, thus you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, then how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Why should you die? A warning is needed. A warning is needed to the people who are on the outside. A warning is needed to the people who are on the inside. We need to be vigilant about what we do and what we say and how we act and how we live. Because we are a reflection of who Jesus Christ is supposed to be. Because whenever we go, and, and it's Stephanie's time over here. She's on this other side of here all by herself. But how many people come into the place where she works at? And that, and I wasn't even looking at her, I'm pointing at her. And that is the only Christ that the people who come to that place out in Boger City, that's where you used to call it, Goodsonville, that's the only Christ that they're going to see. You're the only Christ that the people whom you're around are going to see. And the very deep question is, what are you proclaiming? Scripture tonight relates from one end to the other. Jesus came by the very power of the Spirit. And he came to heal. He came to set free. He came to, to pick up those who were hurting and broken. He came to do all these things. And when people said, stay here a while. He said, I can't. i got to keep going. Don't sit down because you think you've already done the work. Your work has just begun. Understand that it's not the fact that you have maybe witnessed to many, many people, but your work has only begun. You might be here tonight, and, and you have had conflicts in your life, and you have had things, uh, as Pastor Joy spoke this morning, the fact that there are many things that happen in our life, and we work through issues, and things happen. And a lot of these things happen that I can sit down and I can talk to somebody else who's going through the same thing. Because we have found victory in Jesus Christ because we have come through it. Not because we don't have scars, not because we don't have memories, not because of these things that happen in our life, but we have come through it. It's on the back side of us. It's back yonder. <laughs> I, I tried to pull one on my wife tonight and she said, no way, because I can't do it tonight. But there, there's, and I'm sure that uh, you might have heard Big Daddy Weiss sing it, I am redeemed, redeemed. And I just want, <laughs> Whew. 
if we could come to a place to understand that we have been redeemed, that those chains and those shackles are gone, that they're not there any longer, and we don't have to put up with it any longer because he set us free. He has given us a victory, and that victory has come through Jesus Christ. And when Jesus came into that place, and he went to those places, he went there for a purpose, and he went down to, to Capernaum, and he went to the places in Galilee. He went to all these places. Why? Because he wanted everyone to know the touch from the Lord. And friends, I hope that whenever you go anywhere, whatever you do, wherever you venture this year and this week and the things of work, that the people who you have encountered will know that you have been with Jesus Christ. You have been in his midst. And to know that in that place that was something happened in your life because you're not the same person anymore. Because there's been a transformation in your life. And I just ask you tonight, just look. Ask yourself a question. What's keeping me from being the person I need to be in Christ? What is in my life that keeps the door closed that I can't witness and somebody can't see Jesus in me? When you come and you look in a mirror at yourself, my wife loves it when I get in the, in the shower and I'm showering and everything and the door's open and about that time the smoke alarm goes off because, boy, I got steam going, okay? But whenever you look in the mirror, you can't see nothing, okay? Unless you wipe it off and clean it. Huh. Did you catch it? There's things in our life we need to wipe off and cleanse so the people can truly see the Lord Jesus Christ who is living in us be revealed. And that we can, they can see him and none other. That they won't see what happened years ago. They won't see those things that were trash and garbage. But they'll see the resurrected Jesus Christ in our life and living in our life and growing in our life as we grow with him. And I just challenge you tonight. If there's anything standing in your way, then... then stopping you from proclaiming Jesus Christ. If there's anything in your life or anything, whatever, is hindering you in giving yourself totally to Jesus Christ, I ask you that you do it. Turn loose. It's not worth holding on to. Turn it loose, lay it down, and let God transform your life. Let God renew your life. Let God give you a life for now and forevermore. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Father. <laughs> For what you've done already, Father God, I just thank you, Lord. Because when you look down upon us as we gathered here together tonight, Lord God, you see our past, you see our present, you see our future. And Father, I know that even as we come and we think about these things, Father God, that we are encountered day by day, hour by hour in our life, and decisions we need to make and decisions we put off and everything that we, we know that there's going to be another day. Well, maybe so, maybe not. Because today might be the last day, the last chance, the last ability, the last time we might be able to hear your word is spoken. And Father, I just pray that you protect us, Father God, that you'll open our ears to hear, our mind to receive what you've spoken tonight. And Father, I just ask you that in the midst of all that's happening, Father God, that you will happen in our life. And that you will be proclaimed true, holy, and righteous as we walk and as we live. Go with us, Father, through this time. And, Father, if there's one of us here tonight that needs to talk, then, Lord, we're here to talk. If there's one here that needs to, to come and to, to kneel at this altar and, and bring those things before you, then the altar's open. Lord, that it's in your timetable. It's in your place. Father God, as we come to you, we ask of you for what you're doing in our life. I just ask for your renewal, your forgiveness, your cleansing, and Lord God, for your power. And may your power rest upon us as we go. Father God, may your safety be provided unto us, Father God, as we travel. But Lord, I just pray that you will give us a door to walk through. I pray that you will give us a person to speak to. I pray that you will give us a person 
Father God, that we can come close to, that we might be able to share who you are in our life. And Father, go with us, protect us, be with the pastor as he returns tonight, be with the family, Father God, that's there in the hospital. And Lord, for those that we've even encountered this day, for the needs that they have, Father God, here in this congregation. May your hand sweep over, Father God. May your hand bring healing. May your hand bring restoration. Because we've already asked it once, but Father, we ask it again. Restore us, Lord, unto the point and place where we need to be before you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what this does to me. Ever. Thanks for coming. Praise God and everything. But you know, I, I have memories. I hear rain and I have memories. Uh, I'm sure Sister Tracy don't have memories. Uh, she and the pastor and my wife and I was sitting out here in the foyer and we were taking turns dumping containers full of water because uh, one of these 30-gallon garbage cans or better, every 10 minutes it filled up. And, and we were taking turns running it out the door and dumping it and bringing it back, you know, you know, to uh, sometimes wee hours in the morning. And thank you, Jesus, and, and right about where Mike and Peggy's sat, and that we used to be a catching place and all that kind of thing, and there's nothing dropping on his head, so that's praise God. <laughs> what God can do, okay? So just, just know, as, as the roof can be sealed, that situation in your life can be sealed too by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. God be with you and bless you.